Cambrian animals continue to amaze, with their unusual features and confusing taxonomy, making them some of the most fascinating of all prehistoric animals. One such animal was Wawaxia, a genus of soft-bodied animals that's look quite similar to a living pineapple, that's possessed large spines and scales, very likely for protection against, at the time, the recent developments of large carnivores. They were originally described in 1899 based off an isolated spine that had been found in the Ogeopsis shale, and was classified as Orthohica corrugata. Further specimens were found by Charles Walcott, admin of the Smithsonian Institution in 1911, at the now-renowned Burgess Shale, which dates to around 508 million years ago, with him classifying them as polychaete worms, citing similarities to other taxa. He then reassigned them to the new genus Wawaxia, which is derived from Wawaxi, the name of several small mountain peaks in Canada, which itself comes from the stony First Nation Nakoda language meaning windy. While there are currently five known species, this video will be concentrating primarily on the type species previously mentioned, as said animals are known from hundreds of complete specimens due to the preservation quality of the Burgess Shale, whereas others are known of only from fragmentary material or limited sample sizes. Wawaxia has quite the unique anatomy, with the range of characteristics that, as will be discussed, has made their specific classification all the more difficult, something shared with a lot of other Cambrian fauna. They were bilaterally symmetrical, and when viewed from the top, appear elliptical with no distinct head or tail, and appear almost rectangular when viewed from the front or rear. They were also very small animals, being around 2-5cm in length and about 1cm high, excluding the spines on their backs. Their underside was soft and unarmoured, with most of the surface being occupied by a slug-like foot. They were covered in eight rows of small ribbed armour plates, known as sclerites, which lay flat against the body and overlapped so that the rear of one covered the front of the one behind, as well as forming five main regions, the top, upper part of the sides, the lower part of the sides, the front and the bottom, allowing for a good deal of flexibility. They would have served as effective armour, with the root of each sclerite being about the equivalent of 40% the external size, and anchored into a skin pocket for additional strength, rather like mammalian hair follicles. They were also not mineralised, instead being composed of a tough organic, carbon-based biopolymer. It should be noted that the number of sclerites present was not necessarily determined by the age of the individual, as would be thought, as study of different sized specimens has revealed that some sclerites would have grown proportionally with their increased size. In essence, it appears that they would have grown by molting rather than growing extra parts. Their most noticeable trait was, however, their unique dorsal spines, which ran along their back in two rows. Usually, the spines in the middle of the rows were the tallest, but they were sometimes smaller due to damage or replacement, with spines being able to be replaced when lost. Although, like many other animals, the replacement rates would have been faster and more complete in younger individuals, which are still in their active growth stage. The spines can be up to 5cm long, with them also being the most common structure found of them, with them being considerably more numerous than complete specimens. Another defining feature of them was their interior jaw, which had two to three rows of backward-facing conical teeth, with its position indicating the bottom-feeding nature of them, feeding on seafloor particles that fell from the higher levels of their environment, acting as a rasp to scrape up food items. One specimen of a small brachiopod has also been found attached to one of their spines, indicating that they likely did not burrow under the seafloor for cover if such an animal was present, at least at the time of their deaths. Specimens of Wawaxia have been found worldwide, from Canada, China, the Czech Republic and even Australia, indicating that they were quite the successful genus for the time that they were around. As mentioned earlier, they were classified as some form of polychaetes by Charles Walcott, although said classification hasn't been without its debate. Simon Morris, who is notable for his redescriptions of Cambrian fauna, concluded that Wawaxia was not a polychaete, but instead some kind of shellless mollusk. The difficulty in assessing their classification isn't helped by the fact that during the Cambrian, the main groupings of animals recognised today were in many cases only beginning to diverge. Consequently, many lineages that would later become extinct appear intermediate to two or more modern groups, or lack features that would become common later on, hence falling into a stem group. Morris agrees that while there were similarities to polychaetes, he noted that Wawaxia sclerites appear different in their construction, as well as noting similarities between their feeding apparatus and a molluscan radula. Continuing studies and evidence has continued to mount for a molluscan affinity, with details on the mouthparts, scales and growth history further supporting this classification, although they were of course quite basal. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.